World Ocean Day. World Ocean Day. Oh, she said that. I was Tone there. Oh, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to the World Ocean Day special. This is brilliant. We are going out live over the Incredible Oceans channel and Facebook and the Few School channel. And I believe World Ocean Day for schools, which is really awesome as well. Yeah, World Ocean Day for schools. That's so exciting. Um, so I have got my best ocean joke for you russell are you ready that's an ocean joke okay go on yeah. give me the ocean joke yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um why don't clams give to charity because they're shellfish oh my god i knew you were gonna get yes! it yes oh, i thought i was so clever for a second there and you've asked uh, no I, I i'll go i'll go for my rubbish on which i've just thought of um i'm gonna say why did the crab blush do you know what did the sea Why? do something embarrassing the seaweed oh wait wait <laughs> and I, I have got i've got i've got another uh, this one this is a little bit pg this one okay but it's good it's good okay why do mermaids wear seashells i don't know why do mermaids wear seashells because they outgrew their bee shells <laughs> 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 right enough of the bad jokes let's get on with this uh world ocean day special no more bad puns sorry about that everyone so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be exploring the link between climate and climate change and our ocean how those two meld together and how they're basically the same thing what happens in our ocean happens in our atmosphere and vice versa. They are the same system. You can't look at the atmosphere without incorporating the ocean. You can't look at the ocean without thinking about the atmosphere. So we thought we'd start off with one of these awesome few school videos that we put together. And this one basically looks at the science of climate change, the greenhouse effect and what is going on there. Because no doubt wherever you're watching this from any place in the world you are probably seeing some of the effects of climate change happening and it's happening to different countries different ways uh it's a reality and it's something we have to deal with so let's actually see what's causing this and how it's manifesting itself so if we queue up the first video all about climate change isn't our planet amazing it's been around for billions of years, and as far as we know, it's the only planet that has got life on it. But just as life on Earth has slowly evolved, so has our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is a thick layer of gas that starts at the Earth's surface and goes all the way up into outer space. It's mostly made up of nitrogen and, of course, oxygen, the gas that we need to breathe to keep us alive there's loads of other gases floating around in our air and they can have a big effect on how our planet behaves. Two of these gases are carbon dioxide and methane. All living things give off carbon dioxide or CO2 when they respire and methane is given off and things rot or when you fart. In fact, the gas that we heat our homes with and cook with is methane. All these gases act like a big blanket, wrapping around Earth and keeping it warm from the cold of deep space. We call this the greenhouse effect, as the atmosphere acts a bit like the glass in the greenhouse, which lets the sun's rays in, but makes it difficult for the heat to leave again. If our atmosphere wasn't there, the whole Earth would be around minus 18 degrees centigrade, which is as cold as Antarctica. The problem is that all of us are adding extra gases to our atmosphere. CO2 and methane are known as greenhouse gases, as they are making our atmosphere better at trapping the sun's heat. This means that the Earth is slowly but surely getting warmer in a process that we call climate change. Now this might sound quite nice, like it always being summer, but the reality is that these greenhouse gases are causing drought 
and are making deserts get bigger and bigger. Other regions are getting stormier, with hurricanes and typhoons becoming more frequent and more ferocious. And as areas become warmer, new animals and plants move in to compete with those that are already there. But most worryingly, these extra gases are causing the ice at the Arctic and the Antarctic to melt at an alarming rate. There's no land under the ice at the Arctic, so animals like polar bears are losing their habitat. The landlocked ice in Antarctica is melting into our ocean, which is causing it to rise. It's thought that the sea could get deeper by over two meters, which will result in the flooding of lots and lots of coastal towns and cities. Carbon dioxide is also dissolving into the ocean itself, which is making it more acidic. And this causes all kinds of problems for the plants and the animals that live there. So where are these extra gases coming from? The extra carbon dioxide is from burning petrol in cars and in aeroplanes, as well as burning coal and oil and gas to generate electricity in power stations. The extra methane comes from... Uh, cow burps. As cows digest grass, they put it in their stomachs for a bit and then belch it back up and then they chew it some more. That's called chewing the cud and it generates a lot of methane. But luckily, we can all play our part to reduce our carbon footprint or the amount of greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere. Firstly, if you're lucky enough to have a car, then try to only use it when you really need to. So maybe you could get the bus to school or even better, walk or cycle. Secondly, when you leave a room, turn off any lights or electrical appliances that you aren't using and this will even save you money on your electricity bill. Thirdly, buy local. When you're buying food, just check to see which country it came from. And if it happened to come from a country really far away, then it would have flown here on a plane or been shipped here in a boat and it would have given off loads and loads of carbon dioxide along the way. But what about methane? Methane is over 20 times worse for our atmosphere and CO2 is. So a simple way to reduce the methane that we give off is just to eat less meat and less dairy products. Climate change is affecting everyone on Earth and we're all in this together. Earth is the only home that we've got, so it's important that we all play our part to make sure we can all live here as comfortably as possible. So there we go. So that is climate change 101, basically. That's what the problem is. That's what's going on with it. Uh, it's pretty tough. I've noticed in the chat that there's a lot of people from India here. And uh, one of the big problems with climate change and how that's affecting India is that it is causing issues with the monsoons and they're becoming more extreme. Uh, the dry monsoon is becoming drier. The wet monsoon is becoming much wetter and there's much more rainfall. And obviously this has impacts on flooding and farming and all the rest of it. So yeah, it's a big, it's a big issue. There we go. Um, in terms of like what it's doing to the ocean, we touched upon a little bit there about uh, climate uh, about uh, ocean acidification which is a big problem i don't know if you want to chat about that a bit fear um paul you start off and i'll follow up <laughs> okay no worries so basically uh ocean acidification is kind of called the evil cousin of climate change and so climate change as we saw there is extra gases going into the atmosphere that's slowly making our planet warmer but well, those extra gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, then gets dissolved into the ocean. And when carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, which is a type of, yeah, which is an acid. So basically, since we've been burning stuff, our ocean has become 30% more acidic compared to it, how, uh, what its pH was 200 years ago. And this is big problems because if you're an animal like coral, or you're, you've got a shell, it starts dissolving your shell, but it also changes the behavior of animals. Um, it makes them like le less, they don't want to go out and find mates and be less sociable. They become more lethargic. They change the, like their areas that they move around in. It's really, it's really tough. And 
from a from a human point of view, it makes the seafood taste blander and more mushy. So it's actually yes, affecting it our does. food. So yeah. yeah, a lot of those seashells and corals are made out of calcium carbonate, which gets dissolved in strong acids. And another thing that gets dissolved in strong acids is chalk. And so, especially along the south coast of the UK, and I can think of lots of other places all over the world, there are huge, really impressive chalk cliffs. Um, and a more acidic ocean would mean that our chalk cliffs are going to be eroding faster, um, which is another issue with ocean acidification. And I think we're going to get onto coastal erosion later on, but we've got another video to show you guys first, which we is have. also linked to climate change. And this is more about animals showing up where they shouldn't really be found. Um, exactly right. So I mean, this is another really strange thing, isn't it, with climate change is that as so one of the things I was reading earlier is that if you're on in the tropics, the tropics are now getting so warm that animals can't live there anymore. So they're actually moving into into higher latitudes. So they're moving further north and further south away from it. So you're finding tropical species there. But obviously, if you're in the poles where it's traditionally cold, then those areas are getting warmer, so the animals are getting more used to it, and they're kind of spilling down into places they're not. And just up the coast from where I live, which is in Wales in the United Kingdom, uh, we had a really strange thing happen where an Arctic walrus just appeared on the beach one day, and it's been hanging out here, and it's been swimming around England, and it's gone over to France. It's so yeah. it's crazy. His name's Wally. Uh, and so I went to go and see him just down the beach here in South Wales. So this is our next video. It's pretty good fun. If you like walruses, you'll enjoy it. Who doesn't like walruses? Who doesn't like walruses? Love walruses. What is a walrus? And why is there a walrus in Wales? We're here in Tenby on the south coast to find out why. So, what is a walrus? A walrus is a type of marine mammal called a pinniped, which also includes your seals and sea lions. The word walrus comes from the Old Norse, hros valor, which means horse whale. But here in Wales, we call walruses walus, but sometimes we call them morfa, which means seahorse. Not that kind of seahorse. So a walrus's tusks are super long canine teeth. So they're basically water vampires. These teeth grow continuously throughout a walrus's life and can reach lengths of up to a metre long. So what does a walrus use its teeth for? Well, walruses are part of a genus called Odobinus. Genus Odobinus. And that comes from the Greek word odus, meaning teeth, and baino, meaning to walk. Because a walrus actually walks on its teeth. Walruses use these teeth to haul themselves up onto the ice, as well as keeping breathing holes open. They also use them to defend themselves against polar bear attacks and also against other walruses in mating display battles. <laughs> All walruses have a moustache which is made up of sensitive whiskers called mystatal vibrissae, which is similar to the whiskers of a cat. These whiskers can grow up to 30 centimetres long, but over time they get worn down as the animal is searching for food on the seabed. They're so sensitive they can find an object that's only three millimetres in size. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Once a walrus finds a shellfish, they wrap their big powerful lips around it and they draw their tongue into their mouth really quickly to create a vacuum and they suck the creature into their mouth straight out of the shell. And in fact, a walrus can eat up to 70 kilograms of shellfish a day, which is the equivalent of 280 Mars bars. So why is there a walrus in Wales? So globally, there are about two or three subspecies of walrus defined by where they live. So Wally here, he's not a Welsh walrus, he's actually an Atlantic walrus that is normally found on the coastline of Canada and Greenland. So what is he doing here in Wales? So walruses normally live around 40 years, but Wally here, he's quite young, he's only three years old. 
and so mating isn't at the top of his priority list. He doesn't need to be anywhere where other walruses are, so it's more than likely he followed the food here. Sounds like a man after my own heart. <laughs> It has been suggested that one of the reasons Wally may have turned up here in Wales is that he fell asleep on an iceberg and actually drifted all the way here. It's extremely unusual to see a walrus this far south and his appearance here reflects how climate change has impacted animals across the planet. As our climate gets warmer, we're going to start seeing animals change their normal geographic ranges, putting them in closer contact with humans. If you fancy coming to Tembe to see Wally, then can we ask that you don't be a Wally? Walruses are large, powerful animals and can stampede or become aggressive if spooked, so they're highly sensitive to noise and disturbance. So please don't be like those silly people that have been annoying Wally with drones and jet skis. And as nice as it would be for Wally to stay and hang out with us here in Wales, it would be much better for him to go back to the Arctic and rejoin his herd. Incredible Oceans is a non-profit organisation and we rely on the revenue from our channel to keep making these videos. So when we say hit like and subscribe, it really does help us out. Then so make sure you like and subscribe. Press those buttons, the buttons, press the buttons. There we go. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> Very good. There we go, but yes. There we go. So I should probably, I was going to say, I should probably explain that that was Claudia, who's another one of our presenters uh, from Incredible Oceans. She is a marine mammalogist at Swansea University in the uh, in the south coast of Wales. So um, I was like, hey, Claudia, let's go see Wally the walrus. And so she came <laughs> along. She knows all about animals like that. There we go. I love the theory that he just fell asleep on an iceberg. I think that is that's iconic. Do you know, that sounds like something I would do. I'd fall asleep on an iceberg and I'd end up in Japan, you know, just wake up the next morning. <laughs> I, like, I, like the I, I like the fact that was actually something that an actual marine biologist was like, well, this is clearly how he came here. And it's like, really? Like, how many icebergs do you see swim. floating past? He can swim, you yeah, know? <laughs> and everyone was like, this is how it... And there was loads of debate for ages whether he was a boy or a girl. And uh, yeah, so that was that was quite funny. But there, there we go. But yes, so linking it back to climate change, um, yeah, Wally clearly should not be in Wales or in the United Kingdom or anywhere near here. So this is a problem that we're going to see. And it's fine with Wally because it's kind of fun. It's nice having a fun, charismatic animal around. But what we're seeing is problematic species moving into places. And this is a big problem, I know, in some countries where you're getting like really hardcore wasps and hornets and diseases and new parasites moving in, loads of hardcore insects. So this is what's happening with climate change. I mean, we had it in the UK this year in that we had a very, very cold spring and that pushed back um, the oak trees coming out, which meant that there were less caterpillars because there's less leaves for the caterpillars to eat and because there's less caterpillars there's like no blue tit nests at all this year there is no baby blue tits anywhere because of climate change i know that's not ocean related but i care okay that's fine that's fine <laughs> so, <to me. laughs> so really quickly what i love uh we've got here we've got nonny who's on here and i just want to say nonny uh has been saying all lovely things to us so we'd like to say hi to nonny oh, we're gonna do a big hi, shout yeah. out to nonny who has said emphatically, she said, or he said, I will protect the ocean. And I love your program, which is brilliant. And this is what this is what I want everyone to do. So I will protect the ocean. Yes, thank you. So uh, we talked there in the video about pressing buttons underneath. If you are watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, what I want you to do is head over to YouTube and if you're watching on few schools, make sure that you press the like and subscribe button. If you're watching on Credible Oceans, make sure you press like and subscribe. We both release content all the time. And the important thing is it's not for our egos. We're not like, oh, great, look, we've got another one. Oh, this is awesome. We, re we rely as organizations on the income that we get from our YouTube channel. So the more people that like and subscribe, that it really, really does help us out. We want to make education free for everyone. We want it to be, and we want to keep doing our work and educate people about science, about our planet, about our oceans. And so the more people that like and subscribe, 
it's just brilliant and it helps the YouTube algorithms and all that gubbin. So please press those buttons. It's not just to stroke our egos. <laughs> I love your in-depth knowledge of YouTube algorithms. It's very entertaining. Yeah. Um, so moving on, we've got a slightly different kind of video. And this is talking more about the consequences of climate change um, on rising sea levels and the consequences of rising sea levels on coastal erosion um yeah geology rocks um i say that a lot i a big geology nerd over here so there's two different kinds of reasons that sea levels can rise and it's not always to do with climate change so let's find out the other reasons why sea levels can rise hmm. What's up, ocean friends? Welcome back to another episode of Incredible Oceans TV. We're going to talk about sea level change and coastal erosion today, and there is no better place to do that than on the Suffolk coastline, which is one of the fastest eroding coasts in the UK. So as you can see behind me, we've got lots and lots of sand. The geology here is mainly sandstone, which is a really soft rock. But higher up, you can see the rock looks a little bit more solid, and that's because the roots of the plants are binding the soil together. But is sea level rising or are we just sinking? I know, it sounds insane. How on earth can our coastline be sinking? Well, here in Suffolk, we see sea level change as a result of both sea levels rising and our coastline sinking. See, over 10,000 years ago, half of the UK was glaciated. We had glaciers covering Scotland and Northern Europe. The weight of that ice was so heavy that it compressed the top of the UK and the bottom of the UK shifted. Now that ice is gone, the entirety of our country is realigning itself in a process called isostatic rebound. So Scotland is rising and the south of the UK is sinking. In addition to this, we have sea level change as a result of climate change. So as glaciers and land ice melts, we have more water in the ocean. And as the planet heats up, water expands due to thermal expansion. This is known as eustatic sea level change. So all of these reasons are why we see so much coastal erosion on the Suffolk coastline. So what are the consequences to this coastal erosion? Well, just down the road in Dunwich, over half the town has been lost to the sea over the last 200 years. This includes the loss of almost an entire cemetery, which means that commonly, skeletons wash up on the beach. Oh hi there. There is only one gravestone left of this cemetery and that is known as the last grave and this is soon going to be lost to the sea as well. Further up the coast, in Cove Hive, we can see a road that's also been lost to the sea. This road literally stops and goes off the edge of the cliff, and there's tons of warning signs all around it because this cliff is eroding really fast. So these are just a few of the consequences of coastal erosion along the Suffolk coastline. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe, give us a like and a comment, and we'll see you back here next week. I love that video. It's the hottest. I took that on the hottest day of this summer last year. It's 36 degrees. And I was I've got melting. Look. Both but, of the videos that we've shown so far have been like, look, come to the UK. It's so sunny <laughs> all the time. I know. <laughs> Everyone on this live stream has effectively been to the UK now. They've been to Wales and they've been to Suffolk. That's all you need to see. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, there we go. I think that's crazy, isn't it? Because we're so in terms of the, the, the how the climate is working, we've got the Arctic ice at the top and that's melting. But because there's no land at the uh, in the Arctic, the Arctic ice melting isn't actually contributing to sea level rise. So at the moment, what we're seeing in terms of sea level rise is the thermal expansion of it, like as things get hot 
they get bigger. That's how a thermometer works, right? So it's the ice on the South Pole at the bottom, which is locked on the land. And so then if that melts, that is going to raise the sea levels by even more. So we've got two things going on. And all but the way then, here on top of the mountains in the Himalayas, in Peru. Yeah, all and Greenland. Well. Greenland, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, but and then so but then what you were talking about there is from the last ice age, the weight of ice sitting down on the land. So I was in Sweden where the center of the uh, during the last glaciation, that was the middle of the ice sheet. And there it's coming out that the sea, the land is coming out of the crust at nine millimeters a year, which is like over 100 years. That's nine meters difference. That's so crazy. You, so if you look at a map of the Swedish coast from 100 years ago, it's completely different because what were islands have now all come out and joined together and make bigger land masses. So, yeah, northern Sweden, it's it's just they're like climate change. What sea level rise? We don't care about that. They've got different things to worry about. There we go. So um, I feel like we've been a little bit doom and gloom. A little bit doom and gloom we're like climate change our planet what's going on and we talked a little bit about trying to eat less beef and less dairy products obviously doing things with electricity is like turning off electricity and things like that which is really useful not flying these are all the basic things but there's something that's like really important something really cool that has happened in the last year and this is young people kind of taking their future into their own hands and uh, I don't know if you want to talk about this a little bit, Fia. Yeah. So I think young people were really worried about um, climate change anyway. I think I can say that as a young person, um, I was quite worried about it. So and then kind of Greta Thunberg just sort of came out of the well, out of the curtains and started campaigning. Um, all about climate change started really getting the attention of the world leaders and she started something called Fridays for Future which was the school climate strikes and this was really young people showing adults that they're not happy with how the world's being run and so they want things to change and they're going to leave school on a Friday to go and show the grown-ups um, their opinions and their thoughts and it's an excellent way of getting your voice heard and I think for a lot of us we'd started to lose a bit of hope of people ever changing or getting anything done. And I think this whole project has given people a lot of hope that things are changing and things can change. And it's been a really, activism has been a really incredible solution to people suffering from things like climate depression and eco-anxiety. So I think we've got a video that's gonna explain it a little bit better than I just did. Um, so I'm just going to quickly say, just to say this video. So this is a an amazing climate activist here in the UK who we met up with called Eva. She's 12 years old. And when we first got in contact with her, we were like, hey, do you want to come make a video and explain like why, like what the climate strikes and the school climate strikes are all about? And she was like, yeah, yeah, that's totally cool. And so she wrote the script for this herself and performed this all herself. So this was her first time in front of a camera, her first time in a, in a studio. So us and the few schools team went down to YouTube space in London to film this with her. And so I've got to say, like, I, I feel embarrassed as to what I was like at 12. And I was just like, Lego, yeah, you know, and she's here writing scripts, inspiring the next generation of people. Uh, so yeah, let's, yeah. yeah. So ch check out this video from Eva. It's really awesome. Hi, we all woke up today in a world with climate change. I'm part of the Youth Climate Strike movement, started by Greta Thunberg, called Fridays for Future. I am helping to organise my local strike in England. Thousands of scientists around the world have researched the climate crisis and its impact. They have used their education so we can have the facts. The global climate is in serious trouble, and if we don't do anything, then by the end of this century, the Earth will be at least four degrees warmer. Eventually, this will be too hot for life on Earth. 
So we have been taking time out from our studies to teach people this vital lesson. I'm not striking because I don't want to be educated, the opposite in fact. The strike is a way of sending a message. That message is starting to get through. To make it really big and clear, we need something else. If the people in power are to listen to us, we need children, young people and adults to agree on this. Young people understand that to have a future, we must do what is necessary, not what is thought politically possible. We have the imagination, we want a future. We want people who decide the big things about how we use energy, transport, agriculture and industry, all the things that create greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. We want to let these people know that this has to change and fast. These are the things we all need to strike for. We all need a home on earth. We all need to strike together as a protest. The kind of protest that everyone around the world can see and hear. Humans can solve problems as well as create them. I want to see everyone take part in changing everything. There isn't time for us to grow up and wait for this to happen. Every day is a chance to make change. If everyone showed they wanted change on the same day, perhaps a Friday, we might just be able to show the world what needs to happen. This is the future we are being educated. Go wow. Eva. She's amazing. Absolutely, Absolutely amazing. amazing. Yeah, really inspirational. I mean, um, right before coronavirus hit, I think the last thing I actually did was Greta Thunberg came to Bristol, which is just down the road from where I live. And she came and gave a talk and thousands of people turned her out, up and uh, she did a big school strike and they walked through Bristol and closed the city centre and, and Bristol I'm pleased to say as a result of that is one of the greenest cities in the UK, which is why she headed there. So, um, yeah, we need more people to kind of uh, to be passionate and take that on and to be letting the leaders in your countries know that you need to they need to do stuff about this. So, yes, there we go. So there we go. Thanks so much. Please keep the ocean. I will promise to keep the ocean. Yes, this is what you need. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is exactly what we need. We need people's passions. Everyone who's tuned in today on World Ocean Day, we 100% need all of this energy. And uh, yeah, protect the ocean. This is exactly what we need. So thank you, everyone who's watched. Uh, so yeah, we have got some q and a so i'm scouring the comment section here now if you've got any questions uh to me or to fia that you want to uh oh uh there we go so this is this is uh this is andy here he is andy or doog oh I used to, hi andy uh this is andy we used to play in a punk band together shout out to andy go and check out his amazing music uh it was great being in a band with him, but yes, I've got a better promise to keep the ocean. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> I guys watching this as well. All make promises. All make promises. Exactly, exactly. Right, I want to see some questions. So people ask some questions. Stick them in the comment section. Come on, it can be about just general things. I mean, we did we did another live stream earlier on today, and normally kids always ask is that your real moustache and i'm like yes like why would i put on a fake moustache to do a live stream this is it so i gotta say uh emma thanks ever so much appreciate it. thanks for tuning in glad you uh glad you like the program that's pretty cool i'm gonna wear a fake moustache next time you can definitely wear a, a fake moustache yeah. next time uh cool is there anyone else just just come on ask some questions it can be about anything like what's your favorite type of fruit or i don't know what's your favorite color so ask a question, type it in. I can see you watching. I can see I've you got watching. another ocean joke for you. Okay, go on then. If you're interested. Yeah, yeah I always love ocean jokes. What is a blue whale's favourite James Bond film? I don't know. Licence to Krill. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's, I, I've, got a, I've got a really niche joke, which I've remembered. What is a jellyfish's favourite time? I don't know. What is a jellyfish's favourite time? Ten oh four. Because, because the the scientific group of jellyfish is the ten oh four. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, sorry oh, about that. You're such a nerd. 
I know, I'm sorry. Right, we've got a question. Thank you, thank you. Right, are we too late to protect our oceans? Can we still reduce plastic things? Okay, this is a really good question. We are not too late to save our ocean. Uh, last year, a scientific paper came out called uh, The State of Our Oceans. It was published in the, in the scientific um, journal Nature. And it was scientists, about a group of 20 scientists from across the world, all different, uh, all different organizations and different backgrounds came together to look at the threats that the ocean currently faced and things that we're doing really well at and things that we need to start implementing to sort it out. And the conclusion that they came to is that we currently, right now, have the ability, uh, in terms of the technology, to fix our ocean 100%. We can fix our ocean, take it back to what it was like 200 years ago. But we need everyone to be working together. And this is the important thing. Things we are doing really well at are marine protected areas. Like we're doing really well with those um, big areas of the ocean where we're telling people to not go. And in fact, the one in South Georgia has seen uh, the fact that we this massive marine protected area around South Georgia. It's an island in the South Atlantic. And since they implemented that marine protected area, humpback whales have come back. 70% to what their pre-industrial, pre-whaling numbers were. So those are no longer, uh, yeah, no longer a problem. So we have the ability to sort it out. I'm positive about this, but it's all about people watching and all of you guys to put pressure on politicians uh, to, to put policies in place to start doing this. Too much of the conversation is about us. Like you have to stop doing this. You have to stop using plastic. You have to stop driving. And it's it shouldn't be down to us. We need to put pressure on politicians to sort this stuff out. So mm, there we go. We right. Uh, someone has said, Russell, shush. I won't do that, FBI. I'm sorry, the FBI. I won't be <laughs> quiet. Not even you can shush me, FBI. How do we feel about sea spiracy? Yeah. Uh, um, well, I think it was a really good program for raising awareness of the issue of overfishing. Um, it's something that people weren't really talking about before, and I think they are talking about it now, um, which was really excellent. Um, on some levels, it was a little bit uh, sensationalist. So I think they were trying to make big news and big splashes when, and and I, I don't know about you guys, but I felt very depressed by the end of it, that thought that we couldn't actually do anything, when in re reality, there's so much that we can do. Um, and I feel like they didn't always put blame in the right places um, sometimes. Yeah, 100%. Come on, I, I felt that it was really biased. I think I think the the good thing about cowspiracy is it didn't have an agenda. It was an, a guy. It was a guy who was exploring a problem. This came in with a clear agenda and it was like, this is wrong. It was totally doom and gloom. It made out that either you are you need to be in Sea Shepherd jumping in front of illegal fishing boats or you're part of the problem. I also didn't like the way that they framed a lot of the arguments, which were um, Asian people are bad, black people are the victims, white people are here to save the day, which is not how it is. Uh, so I think it, it's good that it's got people talking about something which isn't a very, what's the word, like charismatic thing to talk about, which is fisheries management. And it's good that people and people basically what it comes down to is you need to be more aware of where things are coming from, the food that you're eating. And with fish, it can be really difficult sometimes. Um, what I was on was a podcast called um, called The Cosmic Shed. And me and a load of other marine biologists discussed that. And I'm just going to post the link in here. Uh, but, yeah, if you want to have a listen to that podcast and we go through the, the pros and the cons of um of sea spiracy there we go right what else we got we got some other questions that's how it Ooh, deforestation. to what extent does it extent does it affect climate change that's really interesting uh big question big question so one of the one of the ways which uh i was i learned about earlier this year is something called ocean darkening which is a really strange thing so as we deforest an area, it increases soil erosion. And so the more soil gets washed into our rivers, and then this rivers gets obviously carry that sediment out into the ocean. But what it does there in the ocean is it, it creates a giant 
patch of dark. It's like someone coming along and mixing all the mud up at the bottom of the sea. So that mud then prevents light from the surface to come go down further into the sea and it clogs fish's gills and it makes the sea uh, less productive. But because it's also darker as a, a body, it absorbs more heat as well. So there's this idea of like about how reflective the Earth's surface is. So this is one of those weird feedback loops which we didn't see, like cutting down the trees. It's not just uh, there's less trees to give off, to absorb carbon dioxide and to give off oxygen, but we're also affecting the climate in slightly different ways. There we go. Do we know how much waste is in the ocean? Well, I like memes. All kinds of waste. It's a, it's, uh, if we talk about plastic waste, it is a big problem. Uh, and the problem with plastic waste is that it takes hundreds of years to break down. And in fact, next July, in July, we're going to be doing a live stream about plastic. So make sure you tune into that. But at the moment, about 8 million tons of plastic is added to our ocean every year. And so because that plastic takes hundreds of years to break down, every year, another 8 million tons. I can't even imagine what that looks like, you know? Like if someone said to me 8,000 tons, I'd be like, that's a ridiculous amount. But again, it's like, what is the, we need to put pressure on the politicians. Here in the UK, they recently discovered that all the plastic that we send to recycling, we are actually shipping to Turkey and Turkey are just burning it. And so, you know, it's like, oh, it's not our problem. We'll send it somewhere else. And yeah, um, we need more people to, we need our politicians to put policies in place to prevent companies like, and I'm going to say the companies, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is the biggest producer of plastic bottles and things. And it says, please recycle them on top. Less than 4% of them are recycled. So we need to sort that out. There we go. Any, exactly. I wish our politicians would listen to us, Teacher Russell, thank you. But they are doing whatever they want and they don't think about the future. This is why we need to kick their butt and say, look, uh, if enough people said, I'm not gonna vote for you, I'm not gonna vote for you unless you put some decent environmental policies in place. It doesn't matter what, what your politics are. It just makes economic sense. It makes political sense to not destroy your life support machine. Even the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, have said that you know climate change is the biggest threat to the economy that there is. Why would you not put something in that? There we go. Right, any other questions? Any other questions? Let's keep, hey, Christian, glad you love the ocean. Love the ocean. Yeah, Christian. Uh, yeah, who doesn't love the ocean? Okay, what else we got? Come on, we want some. Can we swim in the ocean? Come on, Christian. Of course you know we can swim in the ocean. Of course we can. What kind of a question is that? Just double and, check on the lifeguard before you go in. Make sure it's safe. Exactly. And I would say, Christian, if you haven't been swimming in the ocean, you're missing out. It's one of my favorite things to do, especially now the summer's here. The water is still freezing cold in England, but 100% go swimming in the sea. It is, it's good for your mind, it's good for your body, and it's a way of engaging with the best place on earth, the ocean. All right, there we go. What else have we got? We got any other questions? Keep them coming in, unless we got any more questions. Oh, I like this one. Let's protect our ocean. Let's protect our jellyfish. There we go. Yeah. Jellyfish Thanks. are like one of the best animals. I'd just like to say, we shouldn't really call them jellyfish, because they're not fish. No. You should, uh, so you're supposed you're supposed to call them jellies now. Got to call them got to call them jellies. Same with cuttlefish. They should be called cuttles. Same with starfish. They should be called sea stars. There That's too much to process, Russell. I think too I can't process, process anything more for today. Oh, here we go. Ooh, what is the biggest ocean? Oh, Here's I another can answer question. this one. I can answer this one. Do you know, go I, on I've then. Got a great answer to this one. Are you ready? Go on, you answer it. All our oceans are interlinked. So technically we only have one ocean. So that would be the biggest ocean. This is exactly true. We don't, we, you, we have to stop thinking about them as oceans. We, so you'll notice whenever I speak, I always say ocean. I never say oceans. It's annoying that I work for an organization called Incredible Oceans. oceans. But <laughs> the reason why it's 
plural is because I do talk about oceans on other planets within our solar system. That's how I get out of that. Good save. Good yeah, save. exactly. But yeah, there is just one big ocean. And whatever happens in one part of it affects the other part. They're not separate. They're all interlinked and the water flows from one to the other. So, yes, there we go. They're all interlinked. Uh, OK, here we go. What about this one? This is a good one. Can we stop the use of plastic right now? Can we? It's I, difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult. So I, I was having this conversation with one of my friends yesterday, actually. This is interesting. So one of the one of the issues is because we are so used to being able, being able to get produce from all over the world all throughout the year. Like here in England, it doesn't matter what the season is. I can go to my supermarket and I can get avocados. There sh I shouldn't be able to buy avocados in England in the middle of winter. So what's happened in order for those avocados to be able to ship to overseas is they're wrapped in plastic to preserve them for longer. So without r plastic wrapping our food, food waste would be three times the, uh, the amount it currently is, which obviously contributes to greenhouse gases and all the rest of it. So the real trick, the easiest way is to buy seasonal and to buy local. And by doing both of those things, you reduce the need of having to plastic wrap your food, which is pretty cool. So in terms of that, it's because we've, be, we've become accustomed to how, you know, we don't have seasons. We're not like, oh, great, here comes tomato season anymore. We're like, yeah, I just want some tomatoes now. And so um, that's 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 the trick one but yeah it's 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 really difficult like plastic i feel like it gets demonized and so again it's like what do you look at so there's there was a big thing in the uk where we banned plastic straws and so we're only allowed to have paper straws now but a paper straw still uses the earth's resources to make it and a paper straw actually has a larger carbon footprint than a plastic straw so it's like it's like you've got to pick your battle do you create a plastic straw that you use for 10 minutes and then throw away and it lasts for 500 years? Or do you use a paper straw, you do the same and then throw away, but it's still used resources. It's like, this is why we need policies and politicians in place that implement this kind of stuff. There we go. Has COVID pandemic helped or made things worse with global warming? Oh, that is interesting. That is interesting. Well, I think, like Russell's just said, if you're talking about it from a purely plastic point of view, everyone's using a lot more disposable plastic now to avoid contamination, to avoid catching COVID. Um, so I think it's definitely made things worse in terms of plastic. But I think in terms of global warming, every year we have something called Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day of the year where we use more resources than is technically sustainable. So resources being water, minerals, um, fossil fuels, everything like that. And because of people not being able to fly and because of the pandemic in 2020, Earth Overshoot Day was in April and normally it's in August. So that shows you the effect that the pandemics had on how many resources and how much CO2 we released in 2020. And I think a lot, well, Scientists think that most of that is due to us not being able to fly um, and people not going on holiday and things like that. So really interesting. Is, I mean, you can there's amazing maps of like before and after lockdowns in different countries and how the air quality in those countries just completely cleared up. Like uh, I know it happened here in the UK. It happened in Italy when they went into lockdown. It happened in across most of China when when the pandemic first hit. Well, so that that's kind of cool, I think. Uh, and our oceans got quieter because we were shipping less stuff. So this was the first time in ages. Like we, our last live stream that we did, check that out on our channels. It's how loud is the ocean? Talks about all the sources of ocean noise. And during the pandemic, this is probably the first time in 50 years that sea creatures have been able to communicate properly because they haven't been subjected to all the boats and the noise and the, of the propellers and everything like that which is pretty cool. There we go. Right. Uh, that's a really good question. And I've got to say another one of the things linking climate change and the pandemic is that the pandemic and pandemics and diseases are really closely linked to the climate and to the environment. 
So if you think about, I mean, there's a lot of talk about where did COVID come, where did, how did it jump species? But in real life, you would never have had a pangolin and a bat forced together in such close quarters that those diseases would have been able to jump around. So in part, the pandemic was caused by intensive animal agriculture. And then it was then spread because we loved flying everywhere. So if we hadn't been flying everywhere and hadn't, you know, had farming practices that allowed those animals to be put together, it wouldn't have happened. But unfortunately, until we start treating animals properly and change our farming practices and like rein in the amount we're flying, it, what we've just experienced is going to keep happening again and again. Yeah, the other thing that's slightly linked to that is um, there are little air bubbles that get trapped in ice and then snow falls and the ice gets deeper and deeper down. Um, so you could technically, as the ice melts, those little air bubbles will come to the surface um, and there's a chance that inside of those there might be old diseases that um, we as humans experienced before but that we got rid of effectively as the ice melts they could come back to the surface again so we could relive old pandemics as well um, if climate change continues which is fun <laughs> anyway how do we get um, fish for food safely so without overfishing Russell uh, well, so this is one of the things going back to what we were talking about with sea spiracy. And so in sea spiracy, it put forward that there was no such thing as sustainable fishing, fishing. And that's actually a load of rubbish because there is so many marine biologists and marine institutions around the world who are constantly monitoring the health of different species of fish stocks. And the key thing here is to, is to just rein it down. Those giant factory vessels, floating fish factories that have these massive nets that extend for miles and just take everything out of the sea. We need to get rid of that approach, skip, like reduce it, make sure that we've got nets with like big enough mesh holes in so the different fish of different ages can get out of that. It's much more targeted and they know what species they're catching. So uh, yeah, unfortunately we do need to, again, we need to make sure that we are telling politicians that these boats are not okay and organizations like Sea Shepherd that are policing the uh, the high seas and stopping illegal fishing from happening. How can we make people aware uh, in society about the importance of oceans in our life? Oh, that is an amazing question. That Great is my, question. I've got to say, and, and that, also, that's my favorite question of this session so far. Um, so, well, you've tuned in. We're here right now. Both us and few schools are doing as much as we can to educate people about our ocean and how important they are. Um, again, this comes down to politics and the politicians. And here in the United Kingdom, we have a national curriculum, uh, which is a list of things that the, that the government have said that teachers need to teach schools. So... Uh, unfortunately, what happens every time a new government comes into power, they change it and they change what's in the national curriculum. Like here in the UK, we're the ninth largest island on Earth. We've got one of the largest coastlines, longest coastlines in the world. But there's nothing in, that needs to be taught in our schools about the ocean. So we're bringing up loads and loads of people who don't know anything about the sea, which is why we're doing what we're doing. And we've started our YouTube channel. And we're working with few schools to try and educate as many people as possible about it. Yeah, so um, the best thing you can do is share our YouTube channel, Incredible Oceans, and share the Few School YouTube channel as well with people that you know. Make sure they subscribe, make sure they're watching videos and they're learning. Um, and then hopefully more people become aware of how to protect the oceans and how to help stop climate change as well. Um, and also, just since we're on the topic, Few School have got a Patreon that you can go and subscribe to. There's three tiers that you can go subscribe to there. You can find us all on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we're also on TikTok, at Incred Oceans. It's on the screen there. So come over and have some fun. Um, you can follow Few School on different social media as well. Uh, and make sure to like and comment and subscribe. I think I already said subscribe, but it's so important I said it twice.
Exactly, definitely. Like I said before, it's not for our ego. It help, really helps us out, guys. Uh, and I'll say also, it's a really great place to contact us and let us know what you want us to make videos about. Like um, the questions that have come up here, that's absolutely brilliant. And thank you to everyone who's contributed these really awesome questions. And if there's a question that you've got that you think, actually, I'd really like to see that answered in a video, or I'd like to see that explained better, then please like drop it in there. Um, that would be, drop it in there. Write it in the comments section. There we go. That would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and there hopefully we, we will see you guys in July for a plastic-themed live stream. Uh, exactly right. There. Yes, so we'll, there we we'll go. talk about plastic in July. But it's been so much fun hanging out with everyone for the last hour. Hope you've all learned something. We've had fun, haven't we, Russell? We've had a great time. So thank you, everyone. And I'm just going to say it again. Press like and subscribe and tell all your <laughs> friends. This is what you need to do. And, there, and enjoy the rest of the day. Have an amazing, happy ocean happy day. Happy World Thank Ocean you. Day. Happy World Ocean Ooh, Day. Happy Woo. World Ocean Woo. Day. There we go. Woo.